Lambeau Field. I could see it right over there through a couple trees. And we're at Ron Holstrom's house for podcast number two, Tailgate Edition. We got a bunch of people. We got everybody geared up in Packers gear, ready to see uh, game four of the preseason. So, hey, let me turn it over to the guys, uh, the real stars of the show. Uh, I'm just uh, kind of a director, producer, who knows, a cook. Got to make sure Rich is fed at the house. Uh, that's another story. Ron, Ron will probably talk about I that. I think the real stars are actually Mike, the chef out there, what he's cooking today. Yeah, I know. He's out in the rain. He's, got, he's ready to roll. Hey, podcast number two, Rich and Ron show. Thank you, guys. I want to welcome everybody. Thanks for stopping in. And I know everyone's excited about the game tonight. Rich just flew in from San Diego. I didn't have to drive too far, a few hours south. So uh, we're here to talk a little Packers, talk a little uh, just about everything, talking about tailgating at Lambeau. We're actually about 989 feet from the south end zone, so we're not too far away. So you wouldn't know it here. Um, unlike a lot of stadiums um, where you usually got a big parking lot or you have no parking, Lambeau's got just about everything. We got small, quaint neighborhoods and we've got uh, big parking lots. So the uh, state of Wisconsin is known for their tailgating. So that's what we're here for. Yeah, you know, Ron, I think you kind of touched base that people don't think preseason games really matter, but it's actually one of the biggest games for the organizations and every NFL team and for the players because it's the, it's the last cut is on Sunday, and the Packers have the historical game coming up on Thursday, 100-year anniversary. So right after this game, they have to go up personnel, meet with the coaches, and they got to figure out who the 53-man roster is, who's going to be their guys on practice squad. And so it's a, it is a significant game for a lot of young men on the roster. Uh, so I want to just touch base on that. And then obviously one of the hot topics out there right now is Andrew Luck. And so we'll touch base on that. And also one of our visiting guests with a lot of history, Andy Reid and the Kansas City Chiefs tonight. We got, uh, we're going to talk a little fantasy football too. That's Vito's favorite. Um, I've already looked at his team already, and I don't think he's going to have a very good season. But uh, <laughs> we're going we're, we're gonna to touch on that a little bit um, uh, here in a little bit uh, through the podcast. Sounds good. Um, I think we'll start off with the hottest topic I think right now in football happens to be uh, Andrew Luck. And so for some of the viewers that may or may not have been here at our last podcast, you know, I superficially introduced Ron's career. So I'm going to have him talk about Andrew Luck, but I don't want his personal experience because Ron was an anomaly, whereas the situation with Andrew Luck, in my opinion, is more of the normal that goes on with players and families throughout their careers and it's but it just has to be brought to the to the light because it's a quarterback position where um i'll reintroduce for some of the people ron for example played 12 years i promise you i never saw him miss one practice okay never had one surgery okay never missed one game okay and he's been very productive post football and so but he saw guys that were very good. I compare Ron to a Brett Favre. If you're going to compare a quarterback to uh, the history of a guy who never misses a game, you know, you have Brett Favre and then you have a Ron Holstrom. So I think uh, I want to get a little input from Ronnie on what you think and some of the input you heard from uh, people about his retirement and your experience with games in the game and dealing with um, – you know, injury and that decision process and Andrew Lux and get your thoughts. I think my kids think I'm an anomaly, Rich. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't know. I don't know about uh, anyone else. I was just very fortunate, very lucky. Um, a lot of time, right place at the right times. I did have one surgery at the end of my career, but um, very, very lucky. And uh, to touch base on what, on what Andrew Luck went through, it's, uh, you know, it's a hard game. It's a tough game. Um, I remember seeing Rich, Rich in the ice tub every day, uh, and that was the norm. That was uh, that's how football was played. You went out and beat yourself up, and you and you had to maintain yourself. And some guys, some guys just uh, couldn't take it. Uh, you know, you look at Andrew Luck and what he's gone through. This guy has had major, major surgeries, and and constant injury. 
Um, you know, and you got a couple different factors now. You know, uh, I think it's the right decision for him. Uh, you can go back to the uh, um, um, Peyton Manning situation when he had his neck fused. You know, if that was really the right decision for him to keep going, um, you know, he had shaken the dice then. But uh, Andrew Luck, you know, he wants a future. He wants, uh, you know, he wants to be able to walk and talk and chew bubblegum. And unfortunately, with the injuries he's had, he's decided to walk away. The benefit of that um, is that the game has changed so much from when we played. You know, we, we kind of made our decisions uh, um, because we kind of had to keep playing. These guys today don't have to keep playing. The money is that good. The money's that great. Um, the retirement benefits, everything that they have, to be able to walk away from the game at an earlier age, um, uh, it makes that decision for those guys a lot easier. What about, Ron, I wanted to ask you, when you talk about retirement benefits, what do you think of the retirement benefits that maybe quarterbacks might have versus your regular player? Because you look at, um, you know, Brady that's taken a less salary compensation and his girlfriend happens to make some pretty good money. His wife, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then you have Rogers now and his gal is Danica Patrick, right? Okay. So you sit here and you wonder with luck, you know, if he has the luxury of taking his choice when he wants to retire, add a little humor to that. But the reality it is my input is it's a great fun game. But I think the process of the anti-inflammatories, taking the um, surgeries and going through that process is different for every person. And the decision-making process, you know, you touch base, you read the papers to the last two days, you had significant um, judgments in a lawsuit against Johnson & Johnson with, with pain meds, okay? And what happens is some people, not just football players, but you get it to managing your injuries to play on Sundays through inflammation, anti-inflammatories, and then you actually have to go through the process. Some people use pain meds and it becomes a problem. And sometimes guys make their individual decision. It's just not best for him. And I think he did it. And I think it was right for him, like you said. I think, I think it's a, you know, uh, just go back and just Google him and look at the injuries that he's had over the years. And, uh, you know, look at that. Look at the money he's made. Um, the ego gets involved in it. I, obviously, professional athlete, uh, a athletics is all ego-driven. Um, it's a tough, tough decision. And it had to have been a tough decision for him. Um, the money makes it a little easier. But uh, it really... Um, you know, some some players play beyond their means. Some play, um, some uh, some leave leave uh, early when they should. Um, I think he's doing the right thing. You know, I think he's worried about his health and well-being. And you let's, know, let's, life, there, you got a long life after football. So yeah, let's. Can we talk a little bit about though the 53-man cut that's coming up um, on uh, on Sunday? And also a little bit about Andy Reid, who actually was, is visiting. He was here with the Packers in 1992. And, and one thing I do want to say, too, though, about the 53-man cut is I remember my rookie year talking about football. It, there is risk in it, but I will tell you, Forrest Gregg, a lot of people, the viewers, he was uh, coached by Vince Lombardi, and, and Vince Lombardi said Forrest Gregg's the best player he ever coached. And I'll never forget sitting next to Ronnie, in the meeting room in 1985, and we just had our rookie roster. So Forrest Gregg had this twitch in his eyes, and he'd have his spectacles, and he'd do his roll, roll call, and he addressed the team at this 53-man roster. And for me, I was a rookie. I felt blessed to make it, and wow, I really was on the team, but I'll never forget what he said. There's some seriousness to it, but also a little humor. He said, men, you never get a better job than this. You play a game, you work six months out of the year, and you get paid an executive salary. He goes, the only way you get a better deal than this is if you marry a rich woman. Okay? <laughs> and, you know, there is a lot of, uh, when you com people compare football to the real world, okay, that is the reality. You do only work six months out of the year. You don't have to make payroll. And it is a game. And so there is a lot of fun into it. So, 
But on the other hand, you never know what could have happened if he didn't play ball. So it's a catch-22, but uh, a lot of the players these days do have very good orthopedic doctors. They're very informed. They also uh, are under a lot better medical care and we wish him the best. But uh, I also think Forrest Gregg had a lot of honesty when he made that quote, when he made the 53-man. All right. What next, Ron? Well, we can talk a little bit about, uh, you know, getting back to the offensive, uh, offensive line play this year because obviously we're offensive linemen. That's kind of what uh, – it's like what we – it's like uh, we, we like to be known as that's our expertise, but uh, I don't think any of us are real experts. You, you but know, uh, we want to talk a little bit about Packers offensive okay. line this year and what, and what you've seen so far okay. in the preseason. You know – I think that's a great subject. And we're not being self-serving when we talk an offensive line, but we superficially introduced Andy Reid, who everyone knows is here, and his history. So, Rich, Rich, yeah. I, I just got a text from Andy, uh, the response from what you texted out this morning, and we know he's getting ready for a game. Yeah, you Let know, me read this. Can oh, I read it? You know what? Go ahead. But can I give a little background on Andy? Vito, I bet him that Andy wouldn't respond. Yeah. Well, so. <laughs> I just got the text. No, you know, he, and we get, when you're given the input, the input is coming from Andy Reid, who is kind of a personal rival with me because he was at BYU and they beat us every year, and I was at San Diego State. So we have a little affinity rival with the schools, and uh, I did text him this morning and asked him if he would give us some input for the podcast. So go ahead, uh, in uh, his input about the offense and defensive lines and what it means to a successful team. So go ahead. It was kind of a nice compliment. Oh, it's just a great, it's just a great text. It's very personal. Uh, it's great to be back in Lambeau. 1992 was a long time ago, but that's where the foundation of the resurrected Packers started. And we know the foundation always starts with the O-line and D-line. Rich and Ron, both great Packer O-linemen. We're here in 92 and help forward the greatness that has taken place in Green Bay since. All the best, Rich and Ron, Andy. Very nice. That's great. Yeah, good that, guy. You know, good guy. Yeah, you know. And, and Andy was a tight end coach when we were here, though. You know, it was kind of interesting. There's a lot of coaches. Um, you know, if you look at that, you got John Gruden. Uh, John was, I always, I always told everyone, John carried around Mike Holmgren's pencils. That's what uh, that's what John was going. And yeah. if you look at, if you look at the Packer game last week up in uh, Winnipeg, Gruden wasn't real happy with the uh, eighty yard uh, field deal. Yeah, that that does tie into uh, some of the uh, critical comments about the head coach here about how he handled yeah. the field. But when you, I remember one thing about Andy Reid is, you know, you're in training camp and they start cutting down the the O linemen they come in. And so we were only two or three deep, and Andy's over there to the right coaching the tight ends, and they're six, seven deep, and we're sitting here sucking air. Ron doesn't miss any reps. And so we're exhausted with two deep, and there's six tight ends. We're going, we should have played tight end. You yeah. know? Yeah. So um, it, it, it's been really f – if there's one guy you want to win a Super Bowl, okay, and you don't want it to be this year because we want it to be the Packers, but you want Andy Reid – to win a Super Bowl. He's one of the best people you've ever met. He cares about everybody. You know, he, he helped forward the Eagles. I know we have a couple of Eagle fans here with our, with our chef here, but he put the platform for the, the coaches there and Howie Roseman, the GM. He developed and, uh, Howie Roseman at, at uh, Philly. And so he always seems to put others before himself. And so it was really nice, even him to reach out like that. Rich, could I just jump in and run? Sure. Uh, as a casual football fan, uh, maybe I call myself casual. I'm pretty fanatical. Mm -hmm. I just respect the heck out of that guy, how he coaches, how he takes the QBs under his wing, the team. He just looks like he's got a heart uh, bigger than, you know, I, I, I just, I love him. I, I really do. And it, you guys probably have just great stories about him. The players coach. Players love him. Organization loves him. You know, you just look at his track record. Look where he's, you know, look what he did when he was here, Philly, Kansas City. Um, great, he, great coach. And he's innovative. Everyone talks about the young coaches like the Rams, but I, I specifically remember uh, I was coaching at Oceanside High School and I was watching the Auburn. Uh, we got an Auburn War Eagle here. Bill Strickland's a guest of ours, played baseball at Auburn. <laughs> and I was watching 
uh, Auburn play Missouri. Missouri was number two in the country, and Auburn had just hired the high school coach, and they put in uh, uh, the, the uh, fly sweep zone read, and they had like 600 yards against the number two defense. And I remember talking to uh, Andy about it. I go, you got to watch this film. you got to watch this film. And now you watch what he has done with the um, – Chiefs, they've taken the West Coast offense and integrated the zone read with Mahomes, and he has gone to what you see in college, but yet manage it and integrate it at all. Yeah. That's what's made him unique, is he's older, but he's really got the youthful offense and taking the change and, and, and capitalizing on it. Right. You know? right. And if he had a defense, if you looked at the end of that game last year, that AFC Championship game, you know... There are definitely some to reckon with, don't you think? I think I think uh, you know he's 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 a, he's a proven coach. Um, his 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 record, you know, other than you throw out a couple years yeah. here and there, everything's everything's on the positive. He's one of those guys that you know it's just one of these years is going to be his years, um, and you know hopefully they're playing the Packers in the right. Super Bowl. So going back to the the O and D line, I think you know the three guys uh, are set at the two tackles in the center. I think uh, the two guards. I'm not sure if the roster set the the two young guys, but I know they have the second rounder from from uh, Mississippi State, um, and he's in the mix. He was actually coached by a, a player I, I represented, Marcus Johnson, who's now the offensive line coach at Mississippi State. Coached him. He was the second rounder of the Vikings, yeah. and yeah. so I know there's some competition there. So I think they're in. Th- Interior three will be better. And so uh, I think, well, as Andy would, said, I think their O and D line gives the platform um, for some yeah. success. Uh, and then the transition from everyone seems to be talking about the head coach here, the young guy who basically has like a LeBron James with Rodgers. And he's yeah. coming in without the Phil Jackson background and coming in. Everyone's looking out going, how is that going to work out? How is that going to work out? Okay, and so your thoughts on that, but I think when it takes care of all of that, but everybody yeah. seems to, because they were jumping on Lafer a little bit during the 80, the the last week when this this the grass field was yeah. only 80 yards. Mud Mudgate. Yes. So, what are your thoughts on people speculating about the relationship of Rodgers and the head coach? And I think it's a little bit overblown, but it is something that's very still in the news right now. Well, it's 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 in the news because the news tries to make it news. That's true. You know, um, you look at the beginning of the year; they were talking about Rodgers and Lafleur not getting, you know, not getting along, and, and and this, that, whatever, and it was all made up. Right. You know? I mean, yeah, that's the problem in today's world: is a tweet goes out or right. or, or a text or something, and uh, you know, it's all to it's all to start start right. some news. You know, I don't think there's any news. The news here. You know, to touch back on the offensive line, one thing I did want to touch on, and I'll get back to this, but uh, uh, the Packer offensive line in the last couple of years has been ranked one of the better lines in the NFL. And I think left guard's the only issue they have right now with the two guys. They brought in uh, Turner and then uh, uh, the draft guy, it, um, Jenkins. You're right. Um, uh, you know, if that starts up front and that gels and that's good, and and Rodgers is back to being uh, Rodgers. I think all the stuff that comes out on the outside, the floor, Rodgers, right. all these guys, it all goes away because then all anyone's talking about is winning football games. Yeah, and, and that ties into, I think, the NFC Central. And, you know, I was um, – obviously I'm affinity to Iowa with you playing there, but I was watching the Detroit game. And when you talk about – the Jaguars offense last year, and you talk about Rodgers, one of the things the viewers might want to know is that the traditional offense was a 21 personnel. We have two tight ends, two running backs, and one tight end. What's running a lot in the NFL now is 10 personnel, which is one running back, no tight ends. Okay, so there's some advantages to having a tight end. And then you have a quarterback like Mahomes who's in the shotgun, so, and can be a second runner, but Rodgers isn't a second runner in, a se- in, in shotgun, no matter what you say. Okay, he's not. But when you look at Brady, you look at some of these co- uh, these quarterbacks who were under center, for example, in the Super Bowl, 
and we're looking at the NFC Central, because we got to look at it, I see a big uh, move with the Lions when they drafted that Iowa tight end the first round. I saw him play the other day. What are your thoughts on that Hawkeye and um, him? And just give a little history on him and what you think of the NFC Central. Um, considering them we have a tight end, we'll have the quarterback under center a little bit more, and um, some input on him. Well, I think I, I, I was hoping the Packers would have got one of those two tight ends that came right. out of Iowa, either Hawkinson or Fant, uh, Noah Fant, who went to uh, Denver, I believe, Denver. Um, both of them are, are pro-ready. They're both – they're both. I've been I've had a chance. I just went Rick, – Rich started talking about San Diego State. I had to get my Iowa glass out just so, <laughs> just so you guys know. Um, but uh, – but I, but I am a Badger fan. Just, you know, this is Wisconsin. Okay. But uh, to get back to uh, the, you know, um, the NFC uh, Central, I think, uh, you know, Detroit's, they, I think that was a great acquisition for them in the draft. Um, yeah, uh, he's proven in the, in the uh, preseason that he's the real deal. Um, you know, they've got Stafford, who's, right. I, I just, I don't, I don't know. We can go to into fantasy league right. now because everyone that's had Stafford in fantasy league probably wanted to shoot themselves. So yeah, we're talking real football right now. Yeah. Before and we I jump know, into I, 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 now, we, now I'm listening. Now, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. you were getting into my segment. Well, yeah. that yeah. But I think you know you look at the Bears. Uh, the Bears have got a good coach. They've they, you know the organization has, has has stepped up and spent some money. Vikings obviously. Um, you know with the money they put into Cousins, they've had some uh, injuries last year that hurt them a little bit. Uh, their running back is back this year, although prone to injury. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. And I think we could start about, Ron talked about the real deal. We could roll into the non-real deal, which is fantasy football. Okay? <laughs> but that may cost you some compensation if you have a few bets. So that's real. Well, Vito, okay. Vito wanted to talk Vito? a little fantasy football. And, and, and for some reason, most guys in fantasy football usually – Unless they have the first pick in the draft, usually you don't like to talk about how the draft went. Vito had the first pick in the draft, so he brought his fantasy uh, draft board today. And uh, he's got a couple of the other players are here. I've had an opportunity to look at it. All I can say is, Vito, you picked like the Packers of 1987. Can you can you be more detailed about that being the old lineman you have? Why, how, what, what don't you like about his pick, Ronnie? And give the well, it's viewers. A, it's 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 a snake draft. So if you understand how it works, you get the first pick, then you go nine guys, and then you get two picks. So so he's got an opportunity for the best three players in all of the NFL. Okay. Okay. Even you can figure this one out. Yeah, thank you, Ronnie. Thanks for the even, compliment. I might even get you thank into you. fantasy. <laughs> so when you look at his picks, I see uh, the top four because you base it all on the top four. Um, he did a pretty good job with his first pick. Of course, you know a blind squirrel gets a nut every once in a while too. So okay. um, he did a good job with his first pick, and it ended there. So I think. Uh, I, I think his uh, his uh, fellow cohorts are going to have a little fun picking on him this year with that draft. No, hey Vito, it's just you know you could have called me for a little advice. You wanted to be the man and do it your way. Did the twelfth guy draw? I know you guys talked about having someone that was dropping out of your draft, and Vito really wanted to get in there, and he was talking like a boxer, you know. Oh, well, I'm going to show Ron, I'm going to kick his butt, but you weren't sure if he was going to get in, so he got into your draft then. Well, I would have loved out. him. It, the, the, the way he's picked, but I, mean, I would have loved him. In our I think draft. I got locked out. Ron, I got he he threw the carrot, you know, dangled the right, carrot. Right, right, And then uh, I would have shown him what a real uh, league looks like. Do you like. think he's big hat, no cattle? Just exactly. Yeah. Well, exactly. Let me That's first correct that. a couple things. Okay. <laughs> first, I was the commissioner of this league for 12 years. It's called Power Sweep. Okay. This is the new commissioner. I handed the baton to Donnie Sell. Okay. Donnie's the country club manager at Oshkosh. We right. did our draft Vito, Monday. That's 12 years of decisions, and that was your draft? Oh, baby. <laughs> well, first of all, I got to correct you. It's a 12 man, so I picked one, 24, and 25. All right. All okay. Right. So my whole strategy, Ron, was to get the three best running backs and the three best running teams, which I took. Saquon Barkley, number one, 24, 
carry on Johnson, Detroit Lions, which are going to be a run-heavy team. And I came right back with Chris Carson because we know the Seahawks are the number one running team in the NFL. So that was my core, and that's how I went at it. I'm going to pass the mic to Donnie. He'll probably disagree, which he disagrees all the time with me. I'm trying to get this youngster up to a level of a commissioner of my stature and my level. And the guy's doing pretty good. Well, he's we got are, a great jersey number. Hey, he's got a great jersey number, yeah. okay? Rich and Ron, good to good see, see you guys you. again. Uh, we give him a little bit of junk about the carry on Johnson pick because he said it's going to be a run-heavy team, but one of these guys is going to be in the lead. Yeah. These guys are going to be throwing the ball to get back, and uh, we gave him a lot of grief. 11 other people in the league, all of our TJ's Highland Steakhouse management, Oshkosh Country Club management, uh, and 11 players all gave uh, Uncle V a little grief on his come around here. Uh, okay. If you look here, carry on Johnson, Chris Carson, this is the round that people were still available um, instead, he picks these two. There's some really good fantasy players here. Um, Thielen's a good player. Obviously, gets a ton of targets. Antonio Brown, Fournette, big runner, strong runner. He's uh, brittle. He's brittle. He's brittle, but he gets a lot of touches. You got Amari Cooper, Ingram, who's going to get a ton of touches in Baltimore. Josh Jacobs looking like a bell cow in Oakland a little bit. Um, solid tight end there. And then you got uh, Williams from Kansas City, who's going to get a ton of touches as well, although check downs from Patty Mahomes. But... Uh, we had to get Vito in the league because we're playing for a little bit of money, and that's free money. So you got to get you got to get V in, uh, pay his entry fee, and that's basically all we get. From Vito, him. I got to touch you on one other thing. My my I daughter, like my guy. daughter, he's is pretty in, confident. My daughter's in a league with us, okay, and and I don't give out any. You know, I'm a little competitive, so I I want to win, okay. So she's in the league with us, okay. She picks by the names she likes, all right. She was in the money last year. So <laughs> <laughs> I got to bring her. We got the horse races going in Del Mar right now. Do you think oh, she can come out to San Diego? We actually had a great time. Rich yeah. told me, he says, you don't have any fun at all. All you do is work. He came by the house and we went to the track. We saw my buddy, Dr. Copolis. Beautiful day out in one mile from the beach. Yeah. I don't think I cashed a ticket, Ron. And yeah, Rich, we could use her. I did not cash a ticket. It just went. I, I donated, donated to Horse Feed and whatever. Anyway, let's. Uh, Ron, I want to talk to you about a couple things here. You mentioned uh, the two tight ends, uh, Font and uh, Hackinson. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Or Detroit. Um, I'm trying to look at the board here, and I don't think. Yep, they, he went right here. Uh, Corey picked him up. I like that kid. He is the real deal. I agree. I agree. I mean, I, I had the opportunity. Um, you know, I go to a few Iowa games. I had the opportunity to watch them, uh, you know, the first couple of years in the league. And and the other one is Fant. Fant is actually, to me, uh, Hawkinson's a little bigger, a little stronger kid. But Fant, hands-wise, just as good, just as good. So, you know, watch, watch Denver and watch, uh, you know, when you get back to, you know, I, 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 you know your, your uh, what is it, your second pick, okay? You know, you're not going to be happy when those, uh, you know, all those passes are going to be going to Hawkinson, you know, on that, uh, you know, second, second three, second four, and it's going to be a little tight end seam move. You should have seen it when I was preparing for the draft. Rich comes over to the house, and he has no idea about fantasy. He's got a little idea, and he's telling me about 10 personnel and 12 personnel and yeah. how I need to study yeah. that. And I said, it's not relevant in fantasy football. <laughs> He's trying, to, he's trying to coach you like he's like Oh, he's I got coached. coached up for three hold hours. Hold on, yeah. hold on. You know, he didn't tell the full story. What I tried to explain to Vito is you got to look at these fantasy football players and where they're at in their contract. So I said, Vito, if you just are considering a player and you look and see if he's in a has a four-year deal, he was drafted and he's going into his fourth year, of a four-year deal, you want to have a big year so you get the new contract, okay? And it matters, and he said, ah, it doesn't matter. I go, oh, it doesn't matter. Okay, why are the guys holding out? So I go, if you look at that, I go, I would just take into consideration that the production year, especially for skill guys, is the contract year. Don't you agree with that? We had Tony Mandridge. That helped us, okay? Hey, Vito, but, what it comes down to is this. You can either pick by a name that you like, pick by 12 years of being a commissioner, or picked by being a coach, okay? 
None of it's viable. It all depends on who gets hurt, who doesn't get hurt, right. and who produces on that Sunday. Because I've had players that were great players, and I've been doing it for four or five years, that have done nothing for me. And I've seen him the next year go and, and, and yeah. help guys win the, win the fantasy league. I agree. It's, it's interesting. That is the wild card. In, in, it's one thing about wild card in football versus other sports is you can't play to not win. Okay, and if you focus on injuries, injuries, you know, you have to be like a race car driver, but it is an intangible element, and you just don't know, and you hope that that is something the Packers don't have a roll on, and we have a lot of healthy players, and we can just get on a roll all year. But that is relevant. I've got a, another quick question for you guys. Um, fantasy football is known to the players as well. I mean, they, they comment on it. Le'Veon Bell just came out and said, did an apology to all drafters last year that drafted him as he uh, did his holdout. But in your guys' opinion, fantasy football-wise, without looking at the board too far, when's an appropriate time for people to take Ezekiel Elliott with the holdout, and when's an appropriate time for them to take Melvin Gordon? Uh, as you can see, Zeke went early in our draft to Chef Mike. Uh, Melvin Gordon was picked up by me in the fourth. But with those holdouts, what can you give fantasy listeners uh, some advice on what you what, what your uh, picking strategy would be there? It 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 part of that depends on what league you're in. You know, what you either PPR or a uh, or a non PPR. You want to have Rich explain to you what those are? <laughs> yeah, please, Rich. <laughs> fill us in. I won't ah, do that to you. I won't I, do that to you. I, anyway, um, you know, it, it, part of it depends on that. You know, and how strong the player is. Uh, the flip side of it is, um, you know, you want guys that are going to produce, and that makes it tough. You know, guy, uh, you know, we've had a couple, you know, Elliot last year, you know, with the uh, with the suspension, you know, the whole suspension thing that was up and down the whole year. So, you know, if you believe in somebody and 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 they're there, take them, you know. But you're always hoping that they make up for those games that they missed. And the reality is, they usually don't. But it usually comes down to the last month and a half of the season. So. I, I'll superficially introduce my thoughts on that. I go back to what Andy said. It comes, it, keep it crayon. O and D line. <laughs> and when you look at the Pittsburgh Steelers offensive line, they had a center and a guard that are going to be Hall of Fame. They're all pro guys going to be Hall of Fame. You look at the Dallas Cowboys, they're left tackle and center. Okay, all pro guys. So the most replaceable position in pro football is running back, period, because it's contingent. Your production is contingent on 10 other guys and the play call and the blocking combination blocks by the guys up front. So I go to who the front is. And just like the Pittsburgh Steelers guy backed up last year's productive. So if you look at the line, usually the guys will be productive. Vito. Yes. I was going to uh, uh, mention, do we have the picture here? Yeah, Although you know. The last, time, the last time Rich was at my house here you in know, Green Bay. I see Rich so calm, so at home in this garage. And the reason is that Rich really knows this space. So we drummed up a picture from a couple years ago. It and actually Rich, wasn't even two years ago. Let me Rich, see that one. No, well, well this picture... It says it all. He's got his wild salmon. Ron didn't want that stinking Hold up on. his you got house. a couple baggies there from sprouts of my ground-up turmeric and ginger root because I don't use anti-inflammatories. Look at that. See yeah. that? And uh, he popped up a table, and, and he, he died in the garage. Hold on. I didn't pop he died. A, Vito, I didn't pop up a tailor. A table. That's where Ron... I supply okay, the table, I can Vito. usually and take care share. of myself, but there, there are a go. lot of people I can't push around, and that's Ron, so... I actually do the natural anti-inflammatory deal. I, I don't use anti-inflammatories. Quite frankly, uh, anti-inflammatories tore up my stomach. I actually had it scoped okay, twice. This has, oh, nothing, say, this has nothing to do with your health. No, it does, because no. why Ron kicked this, me in the garage is not just because I'm not six foot six, 350 pounds of twisted steel and sex appeal OCD this has clean. This go back to when you were drafted okay. and your locker was next to mine. And you were a total slob. That's true. That's okay. true. So I was prepared for you when you came to my house, especially when you said you were going to be cooking chicken and you brought salmon. So it didn't have to do with the wild salmon smell that, and the turmeric that's a stainer? That had nothing to do with it? You ruined that table. I know. i got to keep it in the she shed now before we use it. So 
I will tell you, uh, when you do come to Ron Holstrom's house, there's nothing but hospitality, and it will be memorialized when we get the barbecue going with our chef, Mike, and TJ Highland's food, their drink, Claude de la Tech wine, and a new uh, liqueur they're actually serving here tonight, a liquor that um, Vito is going to introduce. And it's always a blessing to come back here. But I will tell you, profoundly, for me, it's nice to be back here because I actually have a little picture of my daughter there. And um, when I brought up Forrest Gregg in 1986, 33 years ago, I asked our head coach if I could have tomorrow off, which would be the 31st in 1986, and my grand, my daughter was born. So for me, it's kind of nice to come back because in 1986, I not only made the 53-man roster, the coach gave me the day off the next day. We played this the uh, Patriots on August 30th, 16-9, to lost. And then I asked coach after the game, I was scared to ask for it for the day off tomorrow because they were inducing labor. And he gave me the day off. My daughter Ashley was born. And so it's nice to come back here and look back. She was born at St. Vincent. So, it, and Ron's going to provide us some nice food. So I want to introduce that. It's just a blessing to be here. And thank you, Ron, for your hospitality. Rich, you're always welcome. You know that. Uh, it's Wisconsin hospitality. Um, Vito, we're about ready to try a little, uh, try a little uh, tailgate, Hallstrom style. Um, or should I say Wisconsin style. I think we're going to break away here a little bit. We're going to get over by uh, do Chef Mike. Do I have Chef to – can I eat outside the garage today? Or am I still in the, the garage? The tables are already outside. Okay, right? okay, Ron. So we're good. <laughs> we're good. So anyway, uh, we're just going to walk over to the uh, to the chef, see what he's cooking us, and uh, we'll be right back with you. Brought Mike, our chef at TJ Highlands here. And he's got an unbelievable spread. Not nearly something you'd see all the time, but we used to go on our pregame uh, road trips and eat. But Mike has been at TJ Highlands about five months now, and he's got a tomahawk steak, and he's going to uh, give you input on what he has here and he's made for pregame for today. All right? Go ahead, Mike. Hello, everybody. Yeah, I have uh, a tomahawk steak, which is a, a ribeye with a long bone. Um, it's a ribeye with the long bone. Um, it comes from the rib cage area. Uh, we also have the bavette steak, which is from Snake River Farms, which is a Wagyu, which is kind of off of the Japanese Kobe. It's the American style. Um, and this is uh, similar to a flat iron steak. Uh, I have some grilled asparagus, and I have the TJ's Highland Cream spinach that we have. Um, Actually picked a few jalapeno peppers from your next door neighbor's garden. He told me to take them to try out. So, other than that, yeah, that's what we got. So we're gonna get a chance to take a little bite here before we. Rich, Rich, Rich is kind of the food kind of sore here. Chef, he might be wanting some of that jalapeno right there, too. Yeah, you're going to want some of that jalapeno, right? Sure, especially <laughs> we live in San Diego. Thank you. Good. What do you think? It was worth coming to Wisconsin for, I'll tell you that right now. Well, we're going to have some of our guests try your food. Sure. They can come on up. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to segue over here to Vito, and we're going to talk a little bit about the other side of TJ. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Ron. Um, you got a plate there. I don't see any food. Uh, I'm working. You're working? I'm working right okay. now. Well, yeah. I Before all this started here in uh, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, I was fortunate to work with um, T.J. Rogers. He hired me and his beautiful wife, Valida. They're, they're incredible people. They have a winery in Santa Cruz that's spectacular. Explain, you got to explain a little bit about this winery. You were telling me now he he, he built this twelve years ago. Uh, he bought he built this in the late nineties, and it was quite an endeavor. 
It's located in the Santa Cruz Mountains facing the Pacific Ocean. So what it entailed was building his own concrete plant because no concrete company would drive up 1,800 feet, windy roads, redwoods. Uh, and he built a winery, all gravity flow, meaning that the wine starts uh, in the fermentation cave and goes all the way down to the barrel room with no pumps. Uh, it's all gravity. Pinot Noir was what we make, and that's all we make. And Pinot Noir is a very sensitive grape. So he's done extreme amount of work uh, understanding Pinot in the farming aspect and then the vinification aspect, and he mimics everything that old world Burgundy does. Um, he's committed to that, and I'm fortunate to be his managing director, and we're really tra blazing a trail in the Pinot Noir segment and I selling our wine. I think that's great, but you're going you're gonna to have to... Yeah, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll teach you what we got here. Well, you're going to have to teach me names first. Well, for, because, yeah, uh, you guys come up with these names, and I... You know, well, Clodo Latec means. I went to Iowa, so I went to Iowa, so you know we were limited on our wine knowledge. Very simple, Pinot Noir. It's a grape. Uh, that's all we do. The name of the winery, Clodo de la Tech, paying respect to TJ's tech background uh, at Cypress Semiconductor, and Clodo just means wall. And the winery is 100% estate. Uh, we use nothing but the finest barrels, and uh, the wine is very exclusive. I've just started uh, branching out distribution in Wisconsin, Florida, California uh, is really taking hold, and we're looking to go in the Northeast. But let's taste a little wine. Cheers. Cheers. I can learn to love it. I can learn to love it. I'm not a I'm not a wine connoisseur yet, but uh, obviously with some of the innovations that he's come up with because we're going to talk about the next one. <laughs> well, innovation happens in the winery. So he, he's brought a very technical aspect of making wine. Uh, the farming aspect is very old world. So he's marrying the two, in my opinion, and, and he's coming out with what he thinks is the best Pinot Noir in California. And that's our goal. And Valida's a winemaker. I report to her. She's uh, very, very hands-on as, as, as well as TJ. But the innovation part kind of took a turn just recently. We got a, a new project here. It's called Bespoken. And it's a spirit that uh, TJ befriended a gentleman in a past uh, relationship in life uh, in a company. And he's an engineer, a chemist, uh, a doctor. And he's created a bourbon that we could produce, and it's our production facility is in Silicon Valley, so it's got that tech edge. Six days, we could make a bourbon. A, a bourbon that's supposed to be 10, 12 years? Could be 6, 8, 10, 12, and it's called Bespoken. And the beauty of this bourbon is that it tastes really, really good, and it tastes like a well-aged bourbon. So we do two things. We could be a fixer for distilleries that have problems. You know, you're, whether you're in Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, they have bad stuff. We could come in and fix their spirits. And then we're going to launch this. We're actually launching it in Wisconsin next month. And we're going to see what people think about bourbon and a drink that I think you're commonly, it's, it's one of your affections. It's called the Old Fashioned. So we got, got a lot of Wisconsin tailgaters that know what an old fashioned is. So. Well, that's bespoken, and uh, uh, and we got the wine, and now TJ's got the steakhouse and the country club. So it's kind of a it's kind of a trinity, holy trinity here. <laughs> well, it, you know, it's awesome the stuff that he's come up with. I mean, it's uh, it's nice when someone has done what TJ's done, and now he's got plenty of time to bring new things to the to the world. You know. Yeah, and. And what he's done is come back to where he was born and raised, Oshkosh. Um, he's investing in the community. Um, he really likes the Midwest, has an affinity to it. And when I first started working with me, he told me to come out here. And I was like, what am I going to do in Wisconsin? He goes, I, I, want, I want you to look at what some things. And next thing you know, it, I was involved with the steakhouse. 
uh, and uh, we got it up and running, uh, and we got it built, which was a challenge. We went through a very cold winter last year. Remember the winter? Yeah, yeah the poor chef, he came out from Philly, and he landed here the first day of that f minus 50. And he said, I, I don't know about this. <laughs> I so let's... Uh so he's got he's he's got the wine. We've got the uh, the soap that's spoken now. Um, you've got the golf course. You've got the uh, steakhouse at the golf course, and now you have the marina also. The uh... well, we got um, houses at um, Lake Winnebago, and they're uh, house, homes that he bought, and they're Airbnbs, rentals, timeshares, and they're beautiful homes. Um, there's about four. Uh, the process is starting with another house right next to TJ's Harbor. And we haven't talked about TJ's Harbor, but TJ's Harbor is his first restaurant here. And it's off, it's getting south, south of Oshkosh, Black Wolf. And it's a lakefront. You were there when we first uh, met. The first, the first time I met you, I walked in there and I went, wow. <laughs> yeah. I said, what's, what's this doing here? And I think we, we saw a helicopter land. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, EAA, you know, that first podcast, you know, we were competing with the Jets, so. Anyway, we, we were sitting having lunch, and it's a spectacular view, Lake Winnebago. There's two pool slips, so, yeah, there, we, there you go. We got, uh, we got beverage, we got food, we got hospitality. And I, well, I think I, it's great. I think it's great what he's bringing back to the state of Wisconsin. I thank you, yes. Hey, hey, and he's a Packer fan. So. Well, we didn't even go into this. Him and Valida... If we open up the trunk of their car, it's so funny. They got seats. They got the cold weather gear. They got the helmets. They got the the moose ear flip uh, yeah. hunting. What do you call that hat? Uh, it, the Elmer, Elmer Fudd hat. It's Elmer. Elmer Fudds. They got the Elmer Fudds. And what's so cool about TJ and Valida, they don't sit in the club seats yeah. behind the glass. They sit in the bowl. And it's 20, a zero, whatever. They get suited up. And they, I mean, it's ready to go. It's game time. Well, my kids are the same way. They love to sit outside, whether it's whether it's raining, cold, whatever. They'll sit outside. I, 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 I've, I've tightened up a little bit as I've gotten older. I got to get inside. Well, yeah, I experienced that uh, one. The last game uh, we were talking about Detroit. Last game of the year last year was against Detroit. It, w it was a very frustrating game, if you guys remember. Aaron uh, left the game like in the second series, and it was a debacle. But it's great. Uh, I've really gone, you know, it, it's amazing in the community. Uh, I was born and raised in upstate New York, so it's very similar. And uh, the people in Wisconsin are, are fantastic, and it feels like I'm back in New York. Well, we love it. We love it. We love coming to the games here. We love being part of the the tailgate, the tailgate festivities. Um, another couple hours, you'll see cars parked in the driveways and in the front of houses, and uh, tailgating going on. You know, for two or three hours, and then go watch the Packers victory. Got it. Well, hey, I think we're going to resume the podcast inside. All right, Rich. So we're getting ready to close this up. Tell you what, I that uh, steak they had and the uh, spinach and asparagus. It's it was a nice break. I'm glad you and Vito had a time to talk and I could uh, enjoy. I saw you Mike's. put the whole you put I that did. whole plate down. I'm sure they showed it. Uh, they probably didn't show the after effects of it. Yeah, but, I, uh, I, I kind of worked my way out of being the host there and tr pulled you in so I could focus with yeah, Mike. I, I, I caught it. I no, caught it, it. it just is. It's it's nice to have quality food that they have up there. And, you know, when we were at Green Bay, we, all we had was really, uh, it was interesting. I was driving down the street, and I saw uh, the church went to uh, on game day, and I saw Prime Quarter and uh, the pizza place, okay? And yeah. so that's all we had. So to have this uh, food and return home here, it's been just really a pleasant experience, and I'm glad that uh, I went from the garage to the uh, driveway. Hey, Rich, uh, the chef, Go chef got something for Ronnie I got something for you we're okay gonna, thank you we're gonna give you, you guys got? a couple oh a couple tidbits other than the food and the beverage All and right. then hey Ron so Vito sent me uh, a package in the mail one day and he goes do me a favor open this up check it out I open it up and this is actually what was inside of it uh, this is a gift to you because uh, we know you're an avid hunter very nice uh, it's a pretty decent knife 
I may or may not have used it one time just to check it out. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. What's the background on that? It's a Damascus steel. You're on a need to know basis. On that, and it's yeah. a hunter's knife. And when Ron's out doing his thing, he's got that on his belt and he's got a nice sharp knife. And when he gets his buck and 10 pointer, 12 pointer, he's ready to roll. Uh, I know you love wardrobe, so here you go, Rich. What do you got There's here? a little long sleeve for tonight. Ooh, okay, thank you, appreciate it. Oshkosh that. Country Oshkosh Club. Oshkosh Country Club, established was it? Double 18, X. 1899. Thank you. Well, we're gonna close her up, Vito. Let's and go. Let's everybody, we're glad that uh, the guests, uh, hopefully they got a, a little food in their belly, learn a little bit, a little bit more about the Packers and uh, what tailgating in Wisconsin is all about. We appreciate everybody coming out. Thank you so much, and thank you for opening up your house, Ron, to everybody. And it's great to be back here, and we'll see you after the Bear game, right? We'll see you, we'll see you after the uh, Packer-Bear victory. Exactly. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right.